Welcome to the Oil & Gas Report, brought to you by Catch Can. I'm your host, Rob Hislop. We have moved all our equipment out of our Edmonton-based studio and have headed over to Vancouver. We're in this city for the Globe 2012 conference. Now, in case you're not familiar with it, it's something that's actually been around for quite a while. It started back in 1990 and goes every two years. What it does is it brings together leaders of industry, all sorts of people from various industries, and they're talking about trying to make the world a better place. We've been fortunate enough to land a lot of interviews, corporate executives, international agencies, urban leaders, financial executives as well, government policy makers, as well as environmental industry executives. Of course, being from Alberta, we've got a lot of oil sand representation as well. And again, this is the Globe 2012 conference. It's held in March in Vancouver. The theme this year, building a sustainable economy for the 21st century. Joining us now on the Oil & Gas Report is Dave Collier, and you're with the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. That's right, I am. You are one of the many, uh, many people attending the Globe 2012 conference this year. Why is it important for your organization to be represented here? Well, I think it's really important to be here because uh, oil and natural gas, and we represent both, are uh, very important parts of the energy mix going forward, and it's important that, I, that the people who are at this event uh, think about oil and gas as a critical part of the energy mix going forward. Okay, what do you want people to think about when they think of CAP, your organization? A solutions-oriented organization that's uh, interested in education, communications, uh, constructive policy advocacy and improving performance. You've read that in an annual report or something, haven't you? <laughs> well, no, those are, those are the themes that we think are important. And, right. uh, you know, we think all of those are critically important. As we look forward, we've got to, you know, we, we need economic growth, we need environmental performance and we need energy security and reliability. Mm -hmm. And we've got to put all those together. And I'm firmly believe I'm a firm believer that unless we can work constructively as an industry with stakeholders, with governments, uh, with First Nations and others to find solutions, we're not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Is it a change and shift of, of mindset now? Do you find it? Does it seem, the industry seem to be changing a little bit? I, th I would say there's a been a bit of a change mm -hmm. uh, over the last few years. I, you know, I think it's increasingly evident that uh, we need to find solutions to some of the challenges that are in front of us, whether those are environmental challenges or social challenges or how do we, frankly, how do we find and develop the energy that's going to require to be required to meet the demand to fuel the sort of economic growth we're seeing globally. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think the majority of the companies that are members of CAP and are active in industry, I would say the vast majority, are very much of, uh, you know, let's be constructive, let's be solutions oriented, and you know, to be successful, I think you have to do that these days. Right. There, I, I can't remember the name of the book, but I was reading a book once and it said, if you thought big tobacco was powerful, you haven't seen anything till you've seen big oil. And which leads people to believe that big oil got everything it wanted at one time. It seems like things are changing a little bit. I, the landscape, there seems to be more people speaking out. You've got the Keystone XL pipeline. Mm -hmm. You've got the Northern Gateway pipeline now where people are talking about civil dis disobedience, you know, to try and prevent this. How do you convince people that projects are good, that they're safe, and that they're needed at this time? Because that seems to be a, a bigger part of what needs to happen as opposed to, say, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Well, first, let me be really clear. We don't get everything we want. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's some, I know some uh, perhaps think that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, a couple of comments I would make. First of all, if you go back three, four, five years, certainly five and years and beyond, it was very hard to get energy on the public policy agenda. Mm -hmm. It was there. It was uh, relatively low profile. It's always been important, of course, but it was very hard to get any sort of public profile around energy. And that's changing. And I think, frankly, it's changed for the better. Uh, I think we need to have the kinds of conversations we're having about energy and environment and economy. They, they do all have to come together. Uh, I think one of the key issues in terms of why energy is taking on uh, such a higher profile is the environment and specifically climate energy nexus and the discussions about what sort of energy system do we want going forward? Mm -hmm. How do we create a more sustainable energy system? How do we how, get both? Uh, the economic growth we're looking for, the environmental performance we're looking for, and the energy security and reliability we're looking for. So all of those things have come together. Okay. The climate policy dialogue, I think, has uh, put, shone the light on 
on energy and particularly mm -hmm. hydrocarbons. So quite a number of factors, but overall, I think it's a good thing that we're having these discussions. Okay, because do you sense, uh, because uh, as an insider of the industry, is it industry that's being proactive, or is it because the environment's taking on such a higher priority for many yeah. people that industry has to respond? I actually think it's both. Mm -hmm. I think our industry has uh, recognized the need, irrespective of the external pressure, to be more focused on performance and reputation and how we advance uh, our agenda in not only our own interest but broader societal interest. And there's no question, I mean, I, I won't sit here and say that the external pressure on the industry hasn't had an impact. Uh, you know, projects like Keystone XL, like Gateway, where there certainly is opposition to those projects and to the uh, development of oil sands in particular upstream uh, has uh, put us in a position where we need to respond, we need to get make sure that our message is out there mm -hmm. and try and do that constructively and proactively. Another issue of course with sustainability, you are talking about reclamation and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. In a province like Alberta there are all kinds of abandoned oil wells uh, and of course just the the, I guess, the oil sands themselves have also, I mean, you've got to make room for the mm -hmm. equipment and pull all the, all the bitumen out and everything. How, how do you address that? Because, yes, reclamation is happening and you're moving forward, but when you look at everything that's been done over the years, it's still way behind where it could be. Well, I, I, I would uh, differ in that. I think mm -hmm. there has been a uh, pretty active uh, role for industry in reclaiming conventional oil and gas wells. And I think our industry in Alberta and Canada more generally has a pretty good track record in that. If you look at oil sands specifically, mm -hmm. uh, oil, reclamation in oil sands will inevitably lag well behind the activity in mining. And that's simply the nature of the process. Mm -hmm. you, you have to develop a mine, you know, strip the overburden, mine the, the resource uh, over a reasonable period of time before you can actually start to reclaim that. Mm -hmm. So you're inevitably going to see a lag, if you will, between the development of an oil sands mine and the reclamation process. But you know, we've got legal obligations to reclaim. There's a very good success stories on reclamation. You probably heard a little bit from some of the folks here about some of the innovative work that's being done on tailings. Yes, the tailings With management, the dry tailings bonds. The dry yeah. tailings, so that, that's something that will reduce the, the overall impact in terms of tailings ponds and the size of uh, surface disturbance. So there's a lot of good things going on in the technology and environmental side. Well, when you're talking about technology, I mean, the company that sponsors us, CatchCan, makes a zero spill technology and, mm -hmm. and safety equipment as well. Is it, is it something that the industry is ready to embrace right off the bat? Like, yes, if we can make a, a smaller environmental footprint, we'll jump at that? Or is it still cost? Or what might be preventing them from, from jumping ahead and looking at technologies like that? Well, this is a long term. These projects are long term. This is a long term industry. So, uh, you know, companies aren't necessarily going to jump into the application of new technology. Uh, you know, we'll want to demo, we'll want to pilot it, we'll want to demonstrate it, we'll want assurance that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, I think there's a universal view in our industry that technology and innovation is the key enabler on cost competitiveness, on environmental performance, and unlocking the resource so that we can continue to develop. So I don't think there's any question that people view technology as the, if not the answer, certainly a key part of the answer. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be a considered, uh, uh, well considered, rather methodical process in terms of developing technology. One of the really key things I think that the industry is doing is increasingly sharing intellectual property right. around environmental performance. Which is, and just and, new too, and isn't it? And it's new, yeah. and part of the, the driver for that obviously is efficiency and making sure that resources are allocated to those things that have the greatest potential benefit. But the other is to move those technologies more quickly from the, the initial idea phase through pilots, through demonstrations, and on to commercial application. So rather than having you know, different companies uh, you know, perhaps working on the same technology mm -hmm. independently, uh, not taking any advantage of any economies of scale or any of that, let's get those resources dedicated in a more focused way Mm -hmm. And hopefully one of the benefits of that that will accrue from that is the fact that we'll get them in the field sooner. Uh, what happens if something like Keystone XL, which almost seems to be more of a political decision looking at it from an outsider, or Northern Gateway, what if these mega projects can't go ahead? What happens to the industry then? Well, they're obviously the industry needs market outlets. So you know, we, have, we have to be able to produce our product responsibly and we have to be able to attach it to markets. Uh, and in the business we're in, uh, you have to have pipelines and infrastructure to get to those markets. We remain very optimistic that we're going to get 
the pipeline access we need. Mm -hmm. There's no question that uh, Keystone XL was a setback. There's no question that uh, there's some contention around the Gateway project. But those aren't the only options. Those are the options that the market has indicated they're most favorably disposed to. Mm -hmm. And in that context, I'm optimistic that they'll get approved. But uh, you know, there are, other, there are other options, both the U.S. market, uh, Kinder Morgan, for example, uh, to the Asian market, mm -hmm. has a project proposed to expand their existing pipeline to Vancouver. Okay. One example, mm -hmm. uh, you've seen options around rail in the U.S. There's other pipeline options in the U.S. There's the Eastern Canadian market. So mm -hmm. I don't think we're at all in a position where we're looking at significant constraints on oil sands production. But there's also no question that we need access to market and we're going to have to build new pipeline capacity to do that. Dave, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We've been chatting it. with Dave Collier here on the Oil and Gas Report, brought to you by Catch Can.